Um, so it is my distinct pleasure today to, to have Dan Landau uh, give us a talk. Uh, we, we were good enough to reschedule from an earlier time. Uh, and so uh, I'm really excited to hear about this, uh, especially in his, his recent work in uh, somatic evolution, which is of interest to me, and then also doing some really cool single cell stuff. Um, so uh, Dan is, a, is an associate professor uh, in, in medicine at the Weill Cornell School of Medicine uh, and of the Institute of Computational Biomedicine, and is also a core member of the New York uh, Genome Center. Uh, so Dan got his, uh, his MD uh, at Tel Aviv University uh, in, in Israel, and then uh, a little bit later, uh, got decided to go for his PhD, uh, which he did in Paris Diderot University in Paris, France, before moving over to the States, uh, where he did his, uh, his residency in hematology and oncology at Yale, uh, and then also ended up doing a postdoc uh, at the Broad and the, the Farber Cancer Institute. And then he moved over to where he is now, uh, Cornell, and has risen through the ranks there doing some very cool stuff. Um, he's got, you know, he's collected quite a few awards uh, during the time that he's been there, uh, including the much coveted NIH Director's New Innovator Award, uh, which those are really tough to get. Um, anyway, uh, so he's going to talk about uh, somatic evolution, uh, uh, something that's very dear to my heart. So please take it away. Thank you, Scott. I'm counting on you to keep the video on so I can have someone to interact with. Um, these Zoom talks have a lot of advantages, but some disadvantages. Any event, uh, really excited to be with you today. It's a community that, that I really uh, admire, and um, uh, hopefully we can engage uh, on some of these ideas together. Uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, at the heart of the work, start, th there's this understanding of, of, of somatic evolution. So how the 30 trillion cells in our body evolve over our lifespan. And perhaps the most studied example of somatic evolution is the example of cancer evolution, this kind of runaway evolutionary process where cells diversify genetically, there's selection of these clones. And here I'm showing one example where uh, our work and the work of others have shown that um, this clonal diversity, genetic diversity in cancer is a really key to the ability of cancer to evolve, to overcome therapeutic resistance, uh, and to become uh, um, more aggressive. I think the other sort of important starting point is that our work and the work of others in the field, for example, Brad Bernstein and others have shown that in addition to genetic diversity in cancer, um, there's also a whole host of um, non-genetic yet heritable information that is propagated from parent to progeny that allows cells to diversify, that is subject to somatic uh, uh, selection, and therefore uh, is important to this evolutionary process. So the first one is somatic evolution is super interesting, especially in cancer evolution. Genetics makes a big difference, but there's also non-genetic information. And then lastly, in this very abbreviated introduction, because I'd like to get to the data, I'd like to point out that the scope of these investigation has moved radically beyond cancer with beautiful work, especially from the Sanger, that show that in fact, um, this uh, somatic diversity, this we contain multitudes is not limited to cancer, but actually is found in normal tissues and non-malignant disease tissue uh, ubiquitously across the body. So I, I'll show three parts of the work that we do in the lab um, that are all under this theme of somatic evolution in different ways. And I'll start with uh, one of the central challenges uh, in our mind is to how to map genotype to phenotype in somatic evolution. So uh, in the opening slide, we talked about how genetic diversity matters. We also talked about how there's a whole host of non-genetic information that affects uh, cellular diversity. We've all done single cell RNA-seq experiments or read single cell RNA-seq papers. Whatever you um, uh, put on the sequencer, there's some cellular diversity. There's uh, some degree of heterogeneity transcriptionally, phenotypically. We know that there's uh, hetero heterogeneity genetically, but how do we start aligning these two? And we argued that the key to unlocking this problem is to be able to collect 
multiple layers of information, for example, the genotype as well as the cellular state at the level of the single cell, which is the atomic unit of the somatic evolutionary uh, process. Um, and we pioneered a, 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 a bunch of uh, methods and assays uh, uh, to uh, achieve this goal. Um, and I'll, I'll go through a few examples and also try to highlight it, maybe not the specific biology of the disease context, but, of, but sort of the major concept that, that we uh, discovered using these technologies. So the first one I'd like to uh, talk about is this method, which we call GOT, or genotyping of transcriptomes. This is uh, a method that allows us to capture somatic mutations um, together with single cell RNA-seq at high throughput using droplet sequencing. The key uh, sort of eureka moment is that typical 10x uh, sequencing uses tagmentation. Basically, um, in the uh, um, transcript is SNP, and we also only retain a short tag at the transcript end. Um, and we reason that we're missing out on an opportunity to uh, capture the genotype that are also found on tr transcribed uh, uh, um, locus. Um, so what we did is we split uh, the library into two components. Um, one of them goes to the regular uh, short read sequencing um, um, the next uh, pipeline. And then the other one before fragmentation retains the, the entire cDNA. And then we perform amplicon sequencing such that we can capture the mutation and we can capture the phenotype using single cell transcriptomes. And I won't spend too much time because this has been published a couple of years ago, but here's an example. Here we take a, a primary human bone marrow samples from a patient with essential thrombocytosis. This is a, a, um, a type of myeloproliferative neoplasm. You can see that the phenotyping part of the single cell RNA-seq can allow us to detect all the, the expected progenitor subtypes, hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, megakaryocytic progenitors, and so on. But then the genotyping aspect allows us to then layer onto this differentiation map also uh, important genetic information. And you see that in this particular instance, we genotyped calareticular mutations. This is a driver uh, gene in this disease. And you can see that the mutant and wild type cells are commingled throughout this differentiation map, telling us that the mutation does not lead to a whole entire new cluster or cell identity, but rather these are much more subtle changes that we need the ability to genotype uh, in single cell to be able to make those inferences. You would appreciate, I think, that the distribution of mutant and wild type is not homogeneous across this landscape, and indeed, if we can show this differ differently using a pseudotemporal pro uh, progression, um, we can align all the cells in the bone marrow from least differentiated to most differentiated. And you can see that this uh, um, um, mutation has increased fitness, increased cell frequency as cells commit towards a myeloid progenitor fate, and specifically megakaryocytic progenitors that are the culprit of this disease. So in this way, we can ask the, a, a very interesting question, which is, with the same mutation against a backdrop of different cell progenitor subtypes or cell identity, what is the phenotypic uh, fitness impact? And here we show that as cell commit towards monotypic progenitors, the mutation frequency rises, meaning the fitness that this mutation provides increases as well. And another thing I'm very excited about this paradigm is that we can do the novo differential expression analysis. And the reason I'm excited is because when you open up your favorite uh, fancy journal, uh, glamorous general journal paper, if it's a mouse paper, somehow the authors uh, can get by with five mice per group, 10 mice per group, those kind of numbers. And, and why is that? It's because we think that we can control for all the confounders, right? They have exactly the same germline. They grow in ad identical conditions. They have the same diet. Everything is the same, right? But it, when we try to do the same thing in human data, now the expectations that we have maybe dozens or hundreds of samples. And that's because we know that humans are so much more variable. We are, have a much more limited ability to control for all of these confounding variables. But this perspective, what we do here is we compare mutant and wild type cells that are coexisting within the same microenvironment in the same individual, the same germline, the same ethnicity, gender, age, uh, clinical history, everything is the same. The only thing that's different is the mutation, allowing us to do the genotype to phenotype like we were doing in mice, but now directly in primary human samples. And just to give one example, in the calareticulin samples, we identified unfolded protein response and significantly upregulated 
And we think that's related to um, the chaperone function of this protein. So just a kind of high level summary of, of, of uh, this work is that it allows us to superimpose two differentiation topologies that are coexisting in the same microenvironment. And to show, for example, that if we look at committed myeloprogenitors, we see jack stat activation, that's the, the, the pathway we're targeting clinically. But when you look at the stem cells that are sitting at the top of the hierarchy, now we find other therapeutic vulnerability, for example, the unfolded protein response, which we're exploring with collaborators uh, as a therapeutic uh, targeting. The other sort of big picture conclusion is that using this type of technique, we can see that the cellular cancer phenotype is actually an integration between the somatic mutation and uh, uh, the cell identity. Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, our intense interest in uh, clonal mosaicism um, and clonal hematopoiesis is maybe perhaps the best studied example. This is a um, um, uh, project that we did in uh, kind of mapping the differentiation topologies in a clonal hematopoiesis uh, using mouse model. This was with Omar Abdul Wahab. And recently, and again, for the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to speak about this, but this was published last year. We also performed for the first time phenotyping of clonal mosaicism directly in a pa primary patient sample and identified what about DNMT3A mutations allowed them to grow? How is it connected to uh, uh, methylation? So to summarize this first uh, uh, technology, the GOT, this perspective of single cell multiomics is really critical to explore clonal outgrowth in both cancer and normal tissue to connect genotype to phenotype in human samples. And what it allows us to do is to superimpose differentiation trees, differentiation topographies, of clones that are coexisting in the same microenvironment and have cell type specific inferences. Now, uh, we developed additional methods uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, toolkit, for example, a method that adds uh, single cell methylomes. And I will encourage you to check out the paper. Um, we have a, a method that is using long read sequencing. And we applied it to SF3B1, both MDS samples and clonal hematopoiesis. And you can see in this one example that the short read luminous sequencing, the standard pipeline, you can see how the coverage trails off as you move away from the three prime N. But with long read sequencing, we can have a uniform coverage of all the exons and we can capture these misplacing events that are specific to SF3B1 mutation. And now ONT adopted this protocol. So if you uh, want to try it um, uh, locally, uh, now um, it's easy to do so, and I invite you to check out the, the bioarchive. Uh, we are also very interested in mapping clones um, um, to in, in space and to have this kind of spa spatial um, perspective. Um, and we had a paper uh, this year integrating spatial transcriptomics with protein, and we now have uh, capabilities for somatic mutation capture as well. Just wanted to kind of bring it to your attention in case you see opportunities for collaboration. Uh, I'll spend the last uh, few minutes on this uh, first part of the talk, describing a new method that uh, uh, we recently developed, which we call uh, GOT chromatin accessibility or GOTCHA. It allows us to do single cell attack sequencing so together with somatic mutation capture. And part of it is motivated by the fact that the previous methods that I described are all based on genotyping based on transcribed um, um, genes. So if a gene is highly expressed, let's say 100 transcript per cell, that's a huge advantage, right? Now I can base genotyping on many, many copies of the molecule. But if a gene is lowly expressed, let's say like JAK2, uh, this becomes from a, an advantage, it becomes into a limitation and dependency. Uh, such that we have very low genotyping rate when we're trying to genotype using uh, transcripts for lowly expressed gene. So we thought single cell attack could potentially obviate this um, or overcome this. Um, and we generated a protocol that allows you to add an in-drop PCR reaction to the single cell attack protocol such that you can capture a locus of interest. And I would just like to point out, and there's more supporting data in the preprint, that uh, this is independent of fragmentation. So we're not replacing one dependency 
with another, we're actually able to capture genotypes directly from gDNA, not from uh, transcribed molecules, and to do it in a way that's not affected by uh, um, accessibility. And we use uh, cell line mixing experiments where we mix two cell lines with different genotypes. We can readily discern which is which based on the attack profile. And then we can project uh, the genotyping information to show uh, um, uh, high capture efficiency, and, but also uh, very high accuracy. So this is how it looks uh, for uh, primary myeloid fibrosis samples. Uh, you can see here the distribution of different genotypes across this uh, UMAP. And you can see here that we have a major bump in genotyping efficiency compared to um, our experience and experience of others using GOT trans transcript-based or cDNA-based genotyping methods. And what it allows us to do is to do a similar experiment to what I showed you previously, which is to estimate the fitness of this particular somatic mutation as a function of cell identity. In this case, we take a, a differentiation pathway from hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells all the way to erythroid progenitors. We quantify the fraction of mutant cells. And you can see here that the fraction of mutant cells really shoots up as cells commit towards erythroid fate. Now, if we look at samples from individuals that are treated with a JAK2 inhibitor, roxolitinib, now you can see that um, um, this bump goes away and the distribution of mutated cells is relatively homogeneous across this uh, entire spectrum. Um, and that's consistent with our clinical experience. The clones don't disappear when you treat patients with JAK2 inhibitors, but some of the symptoms like the large spleen, they do go away. And we think that's related to this elimination of the specific bump in fitness that erythroid progenitors get when JAK2 is highly activated. Uh, we can do a similar experiment to what I showed you previously. We can isolate a particular cell progenitor type, like for example, H uh, hematopoietic stem progenitor cells. And we can ask, what are the transcription factors that are particularly active when we compare mutant and wild type cells within the same individual? And why is this so important? It's so important because um, work by Ross Levine and many others have shown that in myeloid fibrosis, the microenvironment is intensely pro-inflammatory. Here we show that despite this shared pro-inflammatory microenvironment, where you compare mutant and wild-type cells that are coming from the same microenvironment, the mutated cells have a uh, uh, specific activation of NF-kappa-B, of June FOS, in a way that is higher than the wild-type cells. They also have higher accessibility of an inflammatory response gene, again, suggesting that there is a therapeutic window to target some of these uh, related pathways. We can look at a different cell type, for example, megakaryocytic progenitors. And now you see that indeed, we see this activation of inflammatory pathway, but this is much more specific to June FOS and some TGF beta related pathways and not the NF kappa B. So this uh, uh, allows us to identify mutant versus wild type cell intrinsic differences. Uh, but also to find different cell intrinsic differences if we look at different cellular subtypes. Um, recently, colleagues at the NYGC developed this protocol that uses fixed cells instead of nuclei for single cell attack, allow you to retain the cell surface membrane so we can capture protein expression. So we uh, developed a protocol to integrate GOTCHA with this um, uh, capability. And the other advantage of this um, protocol is because you're retaining the entire cell, you're also getting all of the mitochondria. Um, and that allows you to have a really high coverage of the mitochondrial genome. And in some instances, not all, maybe one in four, one in five, we find uh, that the mutation is completely in phase, completely co-segregating um, with a mitochondrial event, such that again, we can use the mitochondrial mutation to impute uh, the genotype. Uh, and this is using very standard machine uh, learning imputation. And that allows us to now get genotyping status for greater than 90% of the cells in the sample, which to me is, uh, is very exciting. And then because we have the cell surface expression, for example, we were able to identify that CD90 was specifically expressed on mutant hematopoietic stem progenitor cells compared to the wild type. Um, so just to summarize, 
In general, we are very excited about mapping wild type and mutated cells with the JAK2 differentiation topologies to reveal differentiation biases, right? The increase in fitness as they commit towards a retroid phase and the impact of therapy. Now we don't see this anymore. Um, we are able to do genotype to phenotype inference uh, to show cell intrinsic phenotype. Even in the micro uh, environment that's highly pro-inflammatory, we see a cell intrinsic increased pro-inflammatory activation, but it's also cell type dependent. The transcription factor that are active in HSBCs are not the same as in megakaryocytic progenitors. And finally, we can integrate it with mitochondrial tracing, protein capture for really broad multi-OX capabilities. And the other thing that I'm excited about is that uh, we can uh, also work with nuclei, right? So nuclei inherently have less RNA molecule limiting transcript-based genotyping. And with this type of capability, we can now look at the archival frozen tissue with very high genotyping rates. Again, putting it out there, we'd love to collaborate, we'd love to break storm uh, applications uh, with your community. Uh, moving on to the second part, uh, maybe more of a forward-looking aspect of our work, uh, one that I'm very excited about, which is uh, deals with cell state irritability and somatic evolution, and more broadly, um, in looking at phylogenetic trees. Uh, this is a picture from Prospect Park uh, here in Brooklyn. Um, so if you're thinking about evolution in general, and specifically with somatic evolution, I don't think it would be a hard sell to convince you that phylogenetically uh, trees are incredibly uh, useful. They can help us map the clonal origin, the fitness of the clone. They can help us measure uh, fate choices and commitment biases. And also, and I'll expand on this, measure inheritability of cell states in somatic evolution. So to kind of give you a more informal intuition of what I mean, consider that there are, uh, I don't know, 50 people on this call, uh, maybe optimistic, uh, and we generate a phylogenetic tree from all the individuals on the call. And now let's say that we project onto this tree a highly heritable trait, let's say like eye color. We expect it to look more like this tree on the left because we expect that the trait, in this case, the, the uh, white and black uh, circles, is going to segregate differently on a phylogenetic tree. Now, let's imagine that we project onto this tree a non-heritable trait, let's say the shirt color. That depends on something much more stochastic, you know, the mood you woke up with in the morning. And I expect it to look more like this, meaning that there isn't any kind of signal of heritability. So now you can appreciate that um, this type of uh, uh, time machine, if you like, that allows us to get the phylogenetic tree and annotate the leaves or the terminal nodes with particular phenotype allows us to measure uh, in somatic evolution what is the heritability of, of cell states. And why do we care about it? Because everybody's doing single cell RNA seq and they find that tumors and normal tissues have incredible degree of transcriptional state diversity. We know about things like stem cell hierarchies, both in cancer and normal tissue. We know about epithelial to mesenchymal transition. But are these cell states heritable? And we argue that yes, you can ask this question using this novel perspective. So how do we measure heritability? And this also offers a definition for plasticity. Plasticity essentially is one minus heritability. If I can only be exactly the same as my progenitor, as my parent, uh, then I have no plasticity. I have no free will. I live in a deterministic world. If I can toggle between cell states, then that means that there's plasticity. So heritability and plasticity are sort of the reverse complement of the same uh, property. So we developed uh, a method to do this. We use a metric called Moran's eye that was initially developed for ecological study to define distribution in space. So you can see, for example, here that the the blue and pink, pink uh, um, boxes or squares are interspersed perfectly. That's a negative spatial correlation, right? Next to each pink one, I'll find the blue one. I'll never find pink and pink together or blue or blue together. Now we can look at a, a one that has a very strong positive correlation, right? The blues are always together. The pinks are always together. And then finally, random would look something like this, right? So now if we adapt this and now project the same metric on a tree, 
now we can discern between something that is randomly distributed, has no heritability, versus a phenotype that is much more ordered on the tree and likely to be more heritable. And uh, this is also a preprint. Um, we do a lot of simulations with all sorts of, of models. Um, but just to give you a high level uh, intuition, you can imagine two biological scenario, one which there is high cell state heritability, very few transition between cell states. You can see how the tree would look like, and you can see that their measurements would give high degree of autocorrelation. Blue is always next to blue. Uh, uh, pink is always next to pink. You see this in a diagonal and a high degree of, of negative correlation between the cell states, right? They, they are segregating on the tree, and this is the blue boxes you see in the anti-diagonal. Um, contrast this with a scenario where there's high degree of cell state plasticity. Um, cells are easily able to toggle between cell states. Now you can see the tree shows high degree of interspersion of these uh, phenotypes, and also you can see that there's very little in terms of phylogenetic signal. We also took this a step fur further and used it to infer not only if there's heritability or plasticity of cell phenotypes, but also what are their transition dynamics. Um, and here we adopted methods that were used to look at you know, species like the finches and how they migrate uh, from between ecological niches using these kind of phylogenetic trees. But we converted this to look at, for example, a stem cell and how likely it is to become a mature cell through differentiation. And the complement of that, how likely is a mature cell to de-differentiate back into stemness. Um, so we developed this uh, mathematical approach to do this. We, it's, it's computationally very inexpensive because we use analytic rather than uh, um, kind of greedy computational solutions. You can see that our ability to match simulated data is actually very high. Um, and then armed with this uh, approach, we wanted to now turn to data and see what we can learn. So the first data set we looked at is this data set from uh, a paper that was published using molecular recording. This is an artificial lineage tracing method. There's a CRISPR-Cas barcode that gets mutated continuously uh, and allows you to build phylogenetic trees. And this is a mouse model of pancreatic cancer. Now, when we look at spatial location, different metastatic site, uh, and map it onto the phylogeny, you can see that there is very high degree of phylogenetic correlation or heritability uh, to uh, spatial location. That matches what we know about metastatic cancer, that usually it's seeded by a small population or a single cell, leading to this kind of founder effect, such that uh, uh, the cells are ancestry related within each metastatic site. And we have a negative control, which is their circulating tumor cells. They come from this kind of blender that is our peripheral blood, um, where things are much more intermixed and therefore have a much lower uh, phylogenetic signal. But then we took another metric. This is epithelial to mesenchymal transition. We map out each single cell, where it lies on the spectrum between epithelial and mesenchymal. And we map it onto the phylogeny, and you see that there is like a super striking heritability signal. So EMT is a heritable cell phenotype, such that progeny cells that are either in E or in T or anywhere in between are more likely to retain that particular state after cell division and you have a negative control, which is cell cycle. And here you can see that there is a much lower phylogenetic signal. That's because whether a cell is or is, is or is not in cell cycle at any particular moment is a much more stochastic property. Um, and in the EMT world, there's basically like two camps. There's one camp that says, well, these are the discrete states. Um, and there's another camp that says, well, no, this is like more of a transition co continuum, right? Um, so we wanted to shed new light on this question. And what we did is we split the cells based on their EMT status into these kind of uh, contiguous bins um, and asked the question of what is the degree of heritability at each one of those bins? And what you can see is that when we look at these epithelial cells, they have a very high heritability signal. When you look at mesenchymal cells, they have a higher heritability signal. But the transitory states, the ones in between, 
are much more plastic. And that essentially tells us that this um, spectrum of epithelial to mesenchymal transition is both discrete and continuous. Um, the ends of the uh, spectrum show very high degree of stability. Uh, they likely are very fixed. But when you start being in the, in the interim zone, then uh, there's much more uh, of a degree of, of plasticity. Um, so this is basically repeating what I just uh, said. Um, this was using molecular recording. Uh, we also wanted to use uh, some of these insights and to apply it to primary human samples. Um, and um, when you want to try to apply this to primary human samples, you can't use these beautiful methods of, of molecular recording or CRISPR scarring. You have to use what we call native barcodes, something that is on the genome and you can actually track lineages based on this information. And there have been a, a bunch of beautiful work using microsatellites, using uh, copy number variations, using mitochondrial uh, uh, mutations. They have limitations like any method. Um, and um, we had a, a, a different idea. Um, and our idea was that when we looked at the single cell methylone that I, I mentioned briefly in the first part of the talk, we found that uh, there's this kind of stochastic toggling. There's what we call epi mutation. Some people like the term, some people don't, but it doesn't matter. There's in the process of differentiation, of maturation, of proliferation, there are stochastic passenger errors in copying the DNA methylation uh, profile. And they look like this. There's like a random CPG that turns from unmethylated to methylated and vice versa. Uh, these were like naive B cells. They have very ordered epigenome. These were uh, uh, more mature uh, differentiated B cells. They had more of these errors. And then leukemia cells had even more of that. So we realized this can serve as a molecular clock and can actually help us build this type of phylogenies. And we developed the computational methods to infer single cell phylogenies directly from primary patient sample with high resolution um, and with multi-omics capabilities. What do I mean by that? We can also capture the mutation status, for example, for SF3B1 mutation. And without using this information and building the trees, we can then show that this validates the tree inference because only this clade contains mutated cells. We can also get the RNA from the same uh, cells and show that they also have the expected uh, aberrant three prime splicing that is associated with SF3B1 mutation. Uh, when we realize we have this tool and we're excited about uh, essentially uh, looking at cell state heritability, we wanted a great sort of informative uh, case example. And Marius Tuva from MGH published a beautiful series of papers that showed that in malignant gliomas, um, the um, cell state is, uh, uh, is, is varies within individual patients. Um, uh, and it roughly follows uh, neurodevelopmental trajectories. There are cells that are more stem-like. There are cells that are more differentiated. So we asked the question, are those cell states cancer stem cell, glioma stem cell, is that a heritable cell state? Uh, so we generate those, those trees based on DNA methylation. We use uh, genetic marks uh, to have a, uh, a validation of the tree inference. And then we project the cell states that we get from matching single cell RNA-seq. And you can see here that it, it looks more like the eye color than it looks like the shirt color. There's some order in how these cells are distributed um, across the tree skip this. Um, and I mentioned that we can also use this for cell state uh, transition. So our cells likely to move from one state to another. And in this uh, uh, approach, we showed that for a st glioma stem cell to go to a mesenchymal state, they need to go to an astrocytic state as an intermediary. And we validated that using a gliomosphere model using uh, uh, molecular recording that really recapitulated very nicely the correlation structure that we see in terms of cell state transitions uh, in uh, our patient sample. More broadly, what this work showed is that if we consider the differentiation landscape or differentiation topology, um, 
we can have different uh, uh, types of differentiation epigenetic landscape. We can have uh, cases like IDH mutant glioma that most of the stem-like cells are coming from self-renewal, very little from the differentiation. That's what we expect. That is the result of a unidirectional differentiation hierarchy. And that is what gives rise to these trees that look much more ordered. In contrast, when we look at IDH Walter glioblastoma, a more aggressive cancer, here we see that uh, there is a big contribution to the stem cell pool from dedifferentiation. Cells that look like mature cells, let's say astrocytes, that flip back and become uh, stem like cells. And that's consistent with a differentiation topology that's much more bidirectional, um, resulting in this kind of disordered uh, trees. Um, in the last part, and now I see that I'm uh, kind of at the end of a long Zoom there, I, I was kind of a little slower, so maybe after this we can pause for, for questions. Um, but the, uh, we also applied it for uh, another context uh, with BALL, and this time we teamed up with Chuck Awad, who developed this beautiful single cell whole genome sequencing method. This allows us to profile primary ALL samples, primary ALL cells. Uh, directly from a patient sample, build this beautiful phylogenetic trees using 60,000 uh, SNVs without need for single cell cloning with very high fidelity, low dropout rate, low ADO. And then we can map onto this tree additional features. So we can map genotypes. For example, this is a copy number loss. This is a JAK2 subclonal mutation. We didn't use this information when we build the trees. But you can see that, as you would expect, it has a very high degree of heritability, right? Um, we know that, right? We know that if there's a JAK2 mutation, it would be faithfully propagated to all progeny cells unless something very unusual happens. But we can also um, uh, project phenotypic information. For example, cell surface markers, CD10, CD20, CD34. And you can see that not all of them have the same degree of heritability. Some of them, like CD20 and CD34, uh, have clear um, distributions on the tree. Uh, this part of the tree is much more CD34 rich, maybe less differentiated cells. This part of the tree has maybe more CD20 uh, positive cells or CD20 high, maybe more differentiated cells. Uh, and this can also allow us to look, for example, at CD19, which is the target of CAR-T therapy in ALL, and to show that we can quantify the degree to which cells toggle between CD19, CD negative and positive, and potentially inform things like what is the optimal cell antigen for uh, this type of CAR-T directed therapies. So this is package is now uh, online. What it delivers is this ability to measure heritability and its complement, cell plasticity. Plasticity is essentially one minus heritability. It doesn't stop there. We can also provide transition probability. What is the likelihood of a epithelial cells to become a zenchymal? What is the likelihood of a <clears throat> glioma stem cells to become a mature cell? What's the likelihood of a, a CD19 positive cell to become CD19 negative? And to do this indirectly in uh, primary human samples, we can also overcome all sorts of problems in these type of analysis, like low sampling rate or reconstruction accuracy, and use it for discovery. And I showed a couple of examples. For example, the, to show that stem to mesenchymal state transition has to go through a stracytic state. Um, epithelial to mesenchymal continuum is actually partly a continuum and partly uh, discrete states. Um, so we are very excited about these um, applications. Um, so to summarize, high-resolution mapping of single-cell phylogeny using either DNA or DNA methylation um, is very exciting to uh, everyone in the group. Uh, this allows us to do retrospective linear tracing, including in hu primary human studies for biodynamics. I didn't have time to talk a lot about this, but we can estimate uh, clonal emergence timing, uh, clonal fitness. And then finally, the ability to jointly capture the lineage history, the phylogenetic history, and the phenotype allow us to do something that I think is, to me, is quite radical, which is to actually quantify a fundamental property in somatic evolution, which is what is the heritability of cell states? How likely is a cell 
to propagate um, uh, its identity across cell division. Um, and when you can now actually start thinking about it in quantitative term, um, it, this doesn't stop there, right? We can also start understanding the mechanistic basis of this. For example, um, like I showed for JAK2 mutations associated with more uh, differentiated states and so on. Um, I, I'm looking at the time, and I think uh, we don't have time for the self DNA work. Scott, what do you think? Should we just do a, a quick Q&A, maybe more fun? Uh, I mean, we, we have a few more. I mean, you could probably go for 10 minutes. Uh, if you All want. right. Uh, I, whatever, I don't know how interactive your group is. Um, if if they're a quiet bunch, I can keep going. If they if people are interested in chatting, we can stop here and have a more extended discussion. Your so, call, Scott. Yeah, so I, I do know. I mean, the the subject area here is definitely of of interest to a number. Okay, of people. Uh, I'll keep I'll keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, switching gears. This is cell for DNA MRD, um, but it's related, uh, and the way it's related is because um as if we understand cancer as an evolutionary phenomena um if we want to be able to overcome this we need to have real-time monitoring right that's a key to any kind of successful engineering process that's how your ac works that's how we treat patients with diabetes with hypertension we don't just give them therapy we also give them tools to monitor continuously the effective of the therapy and readjust based on this monitoring. And yet in clinical oncology, there are large swaths of the patient's course that don't have information. Myself as an oncologist, um, you know, you can imagine a patient comes um, with a lung cancer, they go to a surgeon, the surgeon removes everything out. Uh, there's nothing on the CAT scan because all the radiographically visible disease went away. And yet we know that a substantial proportion of these individuals will have lethal recurrent disease. We don't know which ones, right? Because we don't have any way of real-time monitoring of tumor burden across many contexts of clinical oncology. Now, when I started the lab in 2016, there were all these amazing techniques that uses, and some of them were pioneered in your neck of the wood, that were using deep targeted sequencing methods, for example, UMIs and duplex sequencing to really get eliminate sequencing error and get exquisite sensitivity. Even one particle out of a million you could detect. So I was super gung-ho and excited to apply these techniques. But when we started looking at the data, there was an interesting disconnect. In principle, these methods could give you a sensitivity of one to 100,000 or one to a million. But in practice, they somehow had a hard stop at around a sensitivity of one to a thousand missing out on people who had radiographically visible disease. So maybe an easier case scenario than the one I described. Uh, and yet approximately 50% of early stage cancer were missed by these approaches, despite the fact that they have this exquisite sensitivity. These are deep targeted sequencing. And we scratched our heads to understand why. And we found an elephant in the room that wasn't discussed at the time. I think now is better appreciated, although not uh, as widely as I would want, which is in a typical plasma sample, you only have an order of magnitude of a few gen thousand genomic equivalents. So each locus in the genome in cell free DNA is only covered a few thousand times. And that puts a ceiling on your sensitivity to around one to a thousand, one to 10,000, because if the fragment wasn't there to begin with, you won't find it. And you can't sequence a million X if you only have a thousand physical fragments covering that particular locus. So how do we breach this? This is a physical barrier, actually about fragments that are there, right? And they're not there. Um, it's not about analytics. It's not about having better sequencing error. It's about something that is much more of a physical property. And we have a eureka moment. And the eureka moment argued the following. Instead of what the majority of the field does, which is to sequence few spots in the, uh, in the genome very, very deeply, let's kind of pivot the problem. Let's think about it from a different perspective and aggregate signal, even with much lower depth of sequencing across tens of thousands of mutations, 
that are found in cancer genomes. The advantages of this is that you no longer kind of scrap, uh, 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 hit your head against the ceiling that is related to uh, the number of genomic equivalents. And what this does, this is the mathematical simulation. You can see that if you look at a single mutation, it's not very different if you have a bunch of mutations. You can see that there is a precipitous drop in sensitivity when you go below one to a thousand, even if you exhaust every last fragment in your plasma sample. In contrast, when you look at 10,000 mutations, here you can see that even with modest sequencing depth, let's say 50x, you can already engage with sensitivity of one to 100,000. So, of course, that brought on a new challenge. And the new challenge is how do we identify mutations, right? The main premise of any kind of mutation calling is to use uh, uh, consensus read, right? We want to find multiple supporting reads for the mutations that are not there in the normal. And that helps us distinguish between a so true somatic mutation and a sequencing error. This is a common principle to every single mutation caller out there. But here we couldn't use it, right? The frequency of the tumor is, let's say, 1 to 10,000. And I'm sequencing at 30x or at 50x. So I know that at best, I will only have one supporting read. How do I differentiate it from a sequencing error? So we needed to rethink the entire mutation calling uh, problem. And we developed uh, advanced machine learning that essentially looks at fragment by fragment, no longer at a specific loci, but rather at individual fragments. And that allows us to say, is this fragment containing a true somatic mutation versus a sequencing error? And this mind shift was actually quite empowering because all of a sudden we had millions of fragments to deal with, which lend itself very nicely to advanced machine learning uh, 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 platforms. So how does that work? Uh, if we uh, just use the principle of going wide, breadth instead of depth, we can already engage with sensitivity of one to a thousand without any fancy molecular uh, barcoding, without custom panels for individual patients, just vanilla whole genome sequencing. But now if we add our error suppression, this ability to go scan read by read and say, this is a somatic mutation, this isn't, we now are able to detect even at the frequency of one to 100,000. So that gives us a, a major boost, one to two orders of magnitude greater sensitivity. And it also is a very quantitative metric. Uh, see the correlation between our uh, admixture and what we infer to be a tumor fraction. That is what I need as a clinician. I don't just need to know yes or no. I need to know, is it going up? Is it coming down? I need a quantitative metric, just like when I treat patients for diabetes. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but we developed a similar sort of methodological framework for copy number variation. And we applied that to different tumor types. This is an example of pre-treatment sensitivity. You see a very high accuracy. This is colorectal cancer. And we went back to these individuals after surgery, just a few weeks after surgery. Uh, these are curative intense surgery in non-small cell lung cancer and colorectal cancer. And we were able to say, these are the patients that have residual disease versus those that don't, and really predict which ones are going to have um, recurrent disease. And that is really key to optimize what we call adjuvant therapy, the addition of therapy uh, after uh, treatment. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, go quickly by, this is a, a new method that we're very excited about. It's a preprint. We use deep learning um, and show all sorts of deliverable. But I'd like to close with a, a, a tiny vignette. And the vignette is when um, um, we publish this paper, we get a ton of reviewer pushback. The reviewer pushback was whole genome sequencing is too expensive. That's why we need targeted panels. And we kept arguing, no, it's going to get better. The prices are going to come down. And we have even this plot that says, what if prices of whole genome sequencing come down and we can sequence at 100x, we can actually get to a sensitivity of one to a million, which is the equivalent of exsanguinating the entire patient's blood volume and using a targeted method like the little drop of PCR. So uh, we promised to the reviewers, sequencing cost is going to drop, and then it stopped dropping. It stayed 
flat at around 1,000, maybe 700 uh, uh, for a 30x whole genome, wouldn't budge, partly related, in my opinion, to commercial reason rather than technological reason. And we started getting anxious because we promised the reviewers that the, the price is going to come down. And that's why we were very excited where this group called Ultima Genomic reached out to us. Um, and it's not an ad for Ultima because now once there is competition, now Illumina dropped the price and other companies dropped the price. So it, the market is actually alive again, but they were able to deliver a hundred dollar genome, just like we promised in that initial kind of a back and forth with the reviewers. So we could show what we predicted. We went up to a higher coverage depth around 120 X and we were able to detect a frequency of one to a million just like we predicted back um, in that paper. But we were also able to do something that would be unimaginable just a couple of years ago, just a year ago, actually, uh, which is to do error correction duplex sequencing at the scale of the entire genome. Uh, so again, this is a very greedy method in terms of sequencing. You need to find the two copies of the duplex. Um, so you lose a lot of reads. And that's why it has been mainly used in, in the context of targeted panels. Here we said, well, if the cost is coming down, let's do a whole genome duplex sequencing. And you can see that it leads to very kind of exciting findings. See here, this is a, a, a patient with melanoma. This is cell free DNA. You can see the expected mutational signature of this uh, melanoma tumor. You can see that if we just look at whole genome sequencing of the sample, the plasma, it doesn't look anything like it. It has all sorts of errors that are uh, uh, unrelated. If we use unique molecular identifier, single strand correction, it gets a little better. But if you look at the duplex, now it matches with precision the mutational signature of melanoma. In contrast, if I look at a normal sample and I match it to a clonal hematopoiesis mutational signature, now you see that we are getting these. And these are likely actual real mutations. They are not sequencing artifacts. They're coming from the host of cells that are found in our bone marrow, and they're matching up with clonal hematopoiesis. And we can use that type of signature matching to detect tumors, even if we don't have uh, matched uh, tumors. So I'll summarize. We're very excited about the somatic evolution. We're excited about these early clonal mosaicism events, how they form, what makes them outgrow their neighbors, how are they changing the physiology of the tissue. We're excited about how as cancers grow, they start having all sorts of abilities to change their genome, their epigenome, their phenotypes, and how all of those are interacting with one another. And then finally, when we start treating patients, now we're trying to chase something that's constantly evolving. And we argue that a critical way to overcome this is to have real-time continuous monitoring so we can optimize therapies accordingly. So I mentioned a bunch of people who helped uh, the group and uh, let me stop here to have a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, that was a really great, uh, really great talk. Uh, can you throw up the, um, the, the, the slide with the- uh, Oh, uh, I, I didn't put it, if someone else has it. Uh, I, I, can, I can put it in the- Great, sorry, I, I, for, I forgot, my bad. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so while I'm uh, putting that in the chat for people to use, uh, yeah, everybody, do, everybody do what what you're told. Sorry, it's my <laughs> my bad for forgetting it. Oh, I see more more familiar faces, uh, names. You're a shy Hi. shy group. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Marshall. Hey, Marshall. Yeah, yeah, that was great talk. Um, yeah, and we were inspired by your work with the you know the F1 crossing. Um, the work you, you've done for lineage tracing using this very interesting F1 crossing approach where you have lots of SNPs and so on. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, well, thank you. Uh, I was really impressed by all the great new technologies. One of the questions I was going to ask was um, about copy number variants, uh, which I thought would be a tough nut to crack, but it sounds like you cracked that for BALL. Uh, you were able to correlate uh, things like trisomies and monosomies. Totally. Um, I mean, yeah. the DNA methylation already, and I did, just didn't have time to talk about it, but the DNA methylation provides really awesome copy number resolution. 
better than single cell RNA seq. And I think it's just related to the fact that we sequence more of the genome. And we have uh, details on this, especially on the 2021 uh, glioma nitrogenetics paper, um, where we developed the methodology for copy number changes. But you're absolutely right that because uh, this uh, single cell whole genome has very low dropout, allelic dropout, so we capture both alleles with a very modest sequencing effort in about 80% of the genome. Um, we can call uh, LOH, copy neutral LOH, um, in sizes, bin sizes that are 25 KB and even smaller. It's really a, an incredible technique that allows us to identify relatively small uh, copy number changes and layer it all as part of this understanding, right? We want, ideally, what's the ideal scenario? The ideal scenario is that I have a high resolution tree. I can have the phenotypes. I can have the genetics so I can see if the genetics are changing, if there's a driver mutation or driver copy number variation. I can have the epigenetics to see if it's a, you know, we have, we reported EZH2 as a critical switch between stem and mature and gliomas. Ideally, when we're working on methods, we can have spatial information to see how these phylogenies are congregated, um, uh, you know, in terms of ecology, which cells are next to them. And this would allow us to essentially look at the cell phenotype and now start teasing out what determines this cell phenotype. What of it is stable and what of it is plastic? What of it is genetic and what of it is non-genetic? What of it is epigenetic or microenvironmental? Yeah, well, I think one of the great applications for it would be in multiple myeloma where there are clearly high-risk cytogenetic changes. And if you could um, figure out what those are and whether there are maybe other cases where you don't have those cytogenetic changes, but you have corresponding changes in gene expression programs, then you could improve the prognostic, pr prognosis and treatment decision-making for yeah. different patients. I totally agree with you. We kind of went for more copy stable systems. Um, and the reasoning was that you can get decent data for aneuploidy with just single cell RNA-seq. Not great, not high resolution, but decent. Um, you can get decent data entries with methods like the ones developed by SAP, Paricio, and Saurabh Shah for high throughput. Um, the, it, the ability to have high resolution trees in copy deployed, copy quiet uh, processes is much more challenging. And that's where the ability to catch SNVs or to use DNA methylation as a, as a lineage marker, that's where these um, uh, deliver an even greater benefit. But I completely agree with you that conceptually, myeloma is a great place to look at this. Thanks. Are there uh, any other questions here? I have one. Hi, Dan. Okay. This is Rosana. Hi. So um, I have a question regarding the duplex sequencing on cell-free DNA. So it's uh -huh. really amazing that you get um, to see the mutational signatures. My question is, how many mutations do you get typically, right? Because you need at least 100 or more to get good mutational signatures. And is, is that many that you can get from cell-free DNA? Great question. So we actually... Uh benchmarked it and there is a figure in the preprint that's the advantage of preprinting everything um, so we show that we can do deconvolution of signatures um, and get detection to say is there melanoma in this plasma or not um, even if we're down to i think between 10 and 100 um, uv mutations so we can deconvolute and sort of the clonal hematopoiesis mutations are stable. And I, I don't have the number off the top of my head because it's also related to sequencing depth. And I don't remember what we chose, but let's say if you have, a, let's say at 1X, you have a thousand true CH mutations in your plasma and you have 10, 20, 30 UV mutations, the signature deconvolution still gives you a positive signal for melanoma. 
Um, but there's a figure that really addresses exactly this very important question. Great, I'll check it out. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the to think, you know, you told me like three years ago, can you do duplex on whole genome in clinical samples of messy cell free DNA at scale? It would be unthinkable. Uh, and now it's like, sure. I'm impressed. <laughs> It's, it, it, you know, it's it's really exciting time because the, you know, in a way we we anticipated it. Um, and that's why we had like, I think a little bit of a, the ability to explore more. We build technologies that are not for the technological ecosystem of today, but for a few years into the future, we said, yes, it's very expensive now, but someone else is gonna solve that problem. So let's build the right technology. and. I think to me that was a really cool way of, of thinking about a, a creatively about a problem that paid off in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, go ahead, Donovan. Hi, Dan. Uh, great talk. Uh, it was really just as impressive as I thought it was going to be. Um, let's see here. Uh, I question generally on the, the the path part about um, cell state transitions. Um, and what's in it, one that's really interesting uh, that you see definitely this drop in the uh, barrier for uh, cancer cells and, and, and carcinogenesis, which is something you'd expect. Do you see uh, any particular just a normal kind of healthy cells? Like, are there cell types that Kind of distribute this, or if you look for this, where there are that change are more plastic than others, uh, or is there um, is there kind of a standard uh, plasticity for organogenesis and and just in, in the body? I think that's really an interesting question to see mm -hmm. if there would be uh, uh, tissue types or, or organ types specifically that that are uh, more transitory than others. I wholeheartedly agree this is a really is something that i'm super excited about and it you know it's it's to define heritability versus plasticity in human tissues um to define what is the frequency of cell transition but also to provide mechanistic information right because we are developing techniques that can give us trees and phenotypes and potentially epigenome. So we know if the epigenome is mediating the heritability. Yeah. Um, we looked mostly in the context of cancer. We have a big effort in the lab to look at um, uh, non-malignant tissues. Um, so I hope I could share information now, but we're very much interested in somatic mosaicism, in uh, normal tissues, solid tissues, blood, but also a lot of solid tissues. Um, and we're pushing really hard, motivated by exactly this question. I think there's so many interesting things, like this, how to couple this with the microenvironment perspective, it, to me, is fascinating. To what degree, you know, we don't think of microenvironment as heritable, but I give the example that I'm a Hebrew speaker, not because of my genome or my epigenome, but like many progeny, I tended to grow up in the same environment as my parents. And we know that you know, if you think about LGR5 example, a lot of cell identity is actually encoded by microenvironment and cytokine gradients and so on. So what is the heritability of that? Or flip, flip the question on its head. If I have strong inflammatory signals in my microenvironment, are they going to induce higher degree of cell plasticity and things like mesenchymal states or things like EMT? I yeah, think exactly. That that's a really exciting uh, frontier that um, we, we are collectively as, as a community excited to explore together. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's a, my thoughts exactly on it. Well, all right. Uh, I, uh, we are a little bit past 2.30 now, so uh, I think we'll close it out unless there's somebody who has a pressing question, but uh, thank you again for such a really cool talk, and I'm really stoked to see the whole genome duplex uh, data. That was very cool. Awesome. Thank you, and so nice to see familiar names and meet some good colleagues. So thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye.